So I'm not going to be talking specifically about licenses, but I will be talking about uh, what you do when you have a, a platform that is itself open and you want to support many different kinds of licenses. So my name is Tim Edwards. I am the VP of uh, Analog and Platform at eFabless. For those of you who don't know what eFabless is, it is a website that is a community-based place for engineers to do design. Uh, right now, it's largely for ASIC design, but we have uh, capabilities for doing everything to board-level design and FPGA design and so forth. Uh, and if you want to learn more, go to efabless.com. That's where you'll find all the information about it. Um, yeah, so we are a place that has largely open source tools on the platform. I'm going to talk mostly about our platform where we do ASIC design. Um, we're using open source tools. All of those are free to use on the platform. For people who want to put together an ASIC, we have IP that is available in an online marketplace, and we have the capability of, uh, or a button that says, uh, free to try. So you can take any IP that's on the marketplace, pull that down onto the platform, the design platform, and use the open source tools to c create a chip, to simulate it, and so forth. Um, but those IP blocks can be either open source or they can be closed source, they can be foundry IP, uh, and so there are many different licenses, licensing models there. And they can be free for, per, uh, free for use or purchase for use or some kind of, um, uh, some kind of agreement for royalties. So uh, as far as building the ASICs, we have custom PDKs that we install there to target specific foundries on the platform. And the key to what eFabless does is that when you're on the platform, well, first, the platform is free to use, so you can get registered for free. Uh, we do go through an uh, authentication process, so you need to be approved. That takes a day at most. Uh, you get on the platform, and you can use the stuff targeting a specific foundry process without signing an NDA. And that's very key. And the result is that you should be able to do fast, easy experimentation of whatever your design idea is without any upfront cost. You, you know, there may be payments, as I said, the royalty things. So if you want to prototype, you'll pay. If you want to put something into production, you'll pay. But just to get the design, just to come up with some design ideas, you don't have to pay for cadence licenses and things like that. It, you just use it for free. Uh, and you should have full access to enough data and tools to get that design done. So there are, of course, pros and cons to this, this uh, model. And from the foundry's perspective, well, the, the foundries like this because they're happy not to have to sign NDAs. If, you have, if you're uh, designing something for academic use or something you want all, a whole bunch of students to, uh, to use this platform, then you can have... 40, 50 students do this all at once, no NDAs. The foundries don't want to deal with that many NDAs. Foundries are also happy not to have to support lots of inexperienced users. So as far as uh, learning how to use the foundry components and so forth, that burden is on us then, and the foundries don't have to deal with it. On the other hand, it is an open platform, and foundries do not like exposing proprietary data, uh, and they do not like to give away IP for free, generally. Uh, and, and this also applies not just to foundries, but for the third-party IP that we have on the platform that, uh, that the same issues apply, that you want to be able to protect the data that's in the third-party IP uh, without compromising the user access to, to open source IP. Uh, so again, from the foundry perspective, there's all this data on the system. We have our own PDKs. Now, what will the foundry allow us to expose to the public on this open platform? And of course, it varies. It varies from things that they're fine with to things that they absolutely will not let you show to the public. Uh, and it goes from simple things like you know, behavioral Verilog models. They have no details in them. Uh, they don't care. You can have things like abstract views of layout, things that come from left files. They're okay with that, generally. Going down, you've got metal stack DRC rules. Depends on the foundry. 
Uh, XFAB, for instance, has that information on public web pages, so we consider it okay to use, to give to people. Um, they're okay with showing primitive devices like transistors, resistors, assuming that it is somewhat obfuscated and that you're not presenting masked data. And then uh, there's a gray area of things that you need to uh, talk to the foundry about, and then things that are almost always have to be uh, protected, and that includes device electrical parameters, complete sets of DRC rule decks, spice models, and anything that's a masked view of a layout. So the idea is find the separating point. For the gray area, negotiate with the foundry. Try to get as much into the top part as you can. The top part is what you build your design environment around, and then the hard work is at the bottom part, figuring out how to protect all that data. Um, so here's one thing you can do for the behavioral ver Verilog. So this is some code that I wrote for a behavioral Verilog model of a uh, XFAB uh, PLL. And you can get by with this as long as you know that the analog IP that you're uh, modeling is sufficiently robust that you don't have to model it in extreme detail. And it's good for top-level chip uh, mixed signal um, simulation and works to a, a good degree. There are a lot of examples of this kind of real-valued Verilog behavioral models that are on my GitHub repository for the PicoRV32 Raven project. For layout, uh, we have two tech files. One of them is a privileged tech file, one of them is a non-privileged tech file. The privileged tech file is generally used not by the users, but by scripts that we run to generate IP to go into the catalog. For the non-privileged version, you cannot generate GDS, you cannot read GDS, because that's all mask data. You can't run a full DRC deck, because that's protected. Uh, instead, to do the DRC, we enforce rules to get, to, to get uh, DRC correct by design, by enforcing keep-out areas and things like that. So you can see that you know, the, the user gets to see mainly back-end layers. They get to edit back-end layers. They don't see all the rest of the stuff. Uh, we are actively discouraging the users from drawing uh, all the layers that don't have DRC rules for them because they'll end up with a design that you cannot fabricate. Um, so we obfuscate primitive, design, uh, primitive devices in various ways. Uh, we use magic for layout, uh, the, the program magic. It's one that I've developed, and I'll be talking about that and other things tomorrow. Um, it, does, it does not use mask layers exactly. It has a translation between what it considers design layers and going to mask layers, which is a process by which you write GDS, and it translates its layers to mask layers. Its layers doesn't include implants and things like that, so you get a fairly obfuscated view, and which all you're really seeing at most is diffusion, poly, and even the contacts are basically contact areas where it's filled with contact cuts by an algorithm. And so there's not that much information you can glean from that as for the exact DRC rules and the mask data. But even if, if that's too much, well, okay, for um, the back-end rules, that sort of thing, you have all the rules available, you can do all the design that you want and get immediate feedback on DRC. But if the obfuscated devices is not enough, you can still go to an even more protected model in which devices, such as these PNPs, we take the GDS, we create a left-like abstract view, which you call maglef or magic and lef, uh, and enforce the rules by having bounding boxes that tell you how to abut it and keep out layers that tell how far it can be from other layers, I mean, from other um, IP. And that way you can do design without seeing what the internal features of the, of the IP are. And that extends all the way up to layers of large IP, like this SRAM here from XFAB, so all the user sees is a left-like view, and they can connect to ports that tells them what layers not to route over and things like that. 
Now, on to uh, SPICE models. That is a problem because you often need to know what your SPICE model is in order to do a design. There are various ways to get around this. Uh, in some cases, if somebody needs a specific, uh, some kind of parameter they need to know in order to do a design, I can just tell them. It's different from just giving them an entire document of all the design parameters. But also we have the system called CASE, the Circuit Automatic Characterization Engine, in which you can uh, simulate various things, and uh, either at the IP level, so characterize an entire IP, or characterize just a single device. And so you can use, uh, use this to help you guide the design, and we have simulation tools and all that. Uh, NG Spice is our Spice simulation. Um, however, the uh, SPICE has to use the device models. The device models are proprietary data and needs to be protected. So this is the kind of thing that we have to go through whenever you have something that is absolutely proprietary and needs to be protected. This gets complicated. We have NG SPICE. NG SPICE is a wrapper. It goes to a, I mean, you can read through all this. I'm not going to go through this in detail. But it goes and the wrapper runs another wrapper in pseudo mode. So with a group privilege, the group can read the SPICE models. However, anytime you run something in sudo, you have to protect the whole system from being gamed by the user. So you use this method called LD preload that protects you from having the user try to uh, do functions like exec that can hose your entire system. But even more than that, you've got uh, commands in ng spice, there's a, a command show and show mod that you can use to actually look at all the parameters of a model. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to protect. So we have our own version of ng spice that we've compiled where we just disable those commands. So that protects all the, the foundry data for the spice models. But it's not trivial, and clearly you don't want to have to do that any more than you need to. But we have to be flexible enough that if foundries have more things they want protected, that we're able to do this for other tools as well. Then there's the problem of data uploads and downloads. So uploading is less controversial. Mainly, we don't want to have people abusing the system by uploading tons of stuff. Uh, right now, we're, uploading, we're allowing uploads in Cloud V, which means we, uh, people can upload Verilog source, but little else. We are discussing extending that to Open Galaxy, the uh, platform where you can do the actual uh, ASIC design. And right now, it's limited to one tarball. That helps prevent people from abusing the system. And we prohibit downloads. That keeps people from using it as a data path to upload and download stuff. Uh, but prohibiting uploads and downloads is definitely a way to discourage designers from using the system, and that's a, a problem that we deal with constantly. I, I feel that we need a more flexible use of uploads and downloads where you can filter data and just run everything that gets uploaded or downloaded. You can run through a set of filters, and if it matches a file format that we're allowing, then you can allow it to go. I think there are some... Websites like Thingiverse that do that sort of thing that allow you to uh, put up certain types of files, and they do that by the content filtering. So on our system, in order to do this in a reasonable way for different foundries, all of which have their own formats for, for their data, we try to get each foundry into a consistent set of uh, files for our own system. And so once, th that's the process of onboarding a new process. And once we've done that, we have, uh, for the foundry, everything is in either libs.ref or libs.tech. Libs.ref is all the foundry IP, so digital standard cells, IO libs, and that sort of thing. And libs.tech is all the files we need to do to set up the open source tools that we're using, like Magic, NetGen, Qflow. And so that's divided into things that are proprietary and non-proprietary, -propri so that when you have SPICE models, that will always be proprietary, GDS, always proprietary. Things like Verilog or Liberty files or kind of gray area. Lib uh, Verilog files depend on how much timing information may be in there. 
Liberty Files depends on how the Foundry feels about you giving out the Liberty Files. Uh, under the tech, as I said, for the magic setup, we have tech files, the proprietary version and the non-proprietary version. Uh, the models is where we keep all the SPICE model data for the process, and that's proprietary. Everything else is non-proprietary. Then within the user's own project space, where they work on ASICs, uh, you, they have their project area is their own, so everything in there they can look at. Uh, however, when they are pulling IP down from the marketplace, IP which can be open or closed, that goes into a special uh, directory in their space called IP, and below that, things are protected or not protected as needed. Uh, for instance, if it's a, the SPY is for the SPICE models, if it's an open source IP, you can read that. If it's a closed source IP, you can't. Uh, then those things that are foundry proprietary data are protected regardless of whether the IP is open or closed. So the extracted SPICE netlist is going to be proprietary and protected. The GDS, of course, is proprietary and protective. Uh, we create these maglev views of anything. So whatever their IP is, we will abstract it into a left-like view, and that goes on the system. That is what everybody sees. So when somebody's designing with a closed IP, they can still see the layout, an abstract view. They can put it into a system. They can simulate it with ng-spice running at an elevated privilege level. And so they're able to do designs with the IP, regardless of whether it's open or closed source. We're getting each of these foundry processes into our system. I've been developing this system called Auto PDK, as I'll say a little bit about, a little more about it tomorrow in my talk. Um, but basically, it's just this large make file that we give it all the information about what the Foundry file format looks like for all the data that we download from the Foundry. And then it goes and maps that to our system so that it knows exactly which files and which places need to be protected, which are proprietary, which are not. And finally, when a user is creating IP, there will be a script that transfers that from the user's project space into the marketplace catalog. While it's in the user's space, they have access to everything. Everything is open to them, regardless of how they've decided to license their own IP. When it goes into the catalog, then it has to be protected, depending on what kind of license they've decided to make it, whether it's open or closed. And uh, likewise, there is Foundry proprietary data in there, so that has to be protected. That maps back to a slide. I had a few slides back where I was showing the, uh, what the IP looks like in the user space, uh, but there's a copy of that in a global space that gets copied every time the user wants to try something from the marketplace. This gets copied into their space, but we have it all set up with the privileges as needed. So what are my conclusions from this? Well, I think that open hardware can coexist with protected foundry IP. I think that protected foundry IP can exist in an open design platform. And the same is true for third-party IP as it is for foundry IP. It's always better, easier, if the foundry is more open and friendly. I don't have to tell you which foundries are more friendly and which ones are less, I think most people know. Um, and the same thing applies. Third-party IP is a lot easier to deal with if people decide to make it open. We encourage people to uh, put open source hardware on our system. And as far as the foundries, it appears in general as the timeline moves forward that foundries are coming around to the idea that open IP is beneficial to them and that it is better to share data than to hide it. And so I think moving forward, this process all gets easier in time rather than harder. So um, that's uh, what I have to say about how we protect data, and I'll be happy to answer any questions on or offline. So thank you very much. Thank you. Wait for it. A little confused by the throwy cube. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, 
I thought uh, this talk was quite interesting, and the idea of um, having a open design flow that uses proprietary data is quite a, a, a neat idea. But one thing that struck me is you're relying very heavily on like uh, OS level security to stop users seeing data they're not meant to see, right? So that's right. You're using file permissions and you're using like sudo and stuff, like uh, things delivered by the OS. And I'm wondering, are foundries really that comfortable with that? I mean, you found one foundry that is, but in general, that seems like quite weak security for what is very important data for them. Well, in the end, uh, it's really the foundries who seem to think that it's very important data. I've never considered that what the foundries are trying to hide is anything that the foundries really need to hide. And as I said, I think the foundries are coming around to the idea that, that keeping all that stuff proprietary is not as important as they've been making it out to be for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, but yes, that's, that's sort of what prevents us from onboarding as many foundries as we would like to. That's why we are currently supporting only XFAB and have just announced uh, a deal with Global Foundries to put their 130 nanometer process on. So yeah, that does, it does have an impact, certainly. It's a mature node. Yeah. And, and I should stress that the stuff that we work with is not 22 nanometer, 16 nanometer. And the foundries who do that stuff are very paranoid about it. And I wouldn't even attempt to go to them and ask if they would let us put our put their data up and only protected by a certain OS level security. Uh, so, I'm sorry, I have, uh, I have two questions. Um, so first question is, um, um, so if you're, um, so I mean, this, this, are, this is quite a crazy effort to, to, to hide proprietary data, but there wouldn't be a solution to go just uh, one level up to abstraction and use uh, generators, so like the Berkeley analog generator, so which, uh, uh, does not need uh, to provide so uh, so many proprietary data uh, so for the user, so you can still hide it uh, somewhere under underneath. Well, because we're using open source tools, there are few scripts and tools that will generate designs that are truly correct by the way the script makes them, uh, and that gets to be a problem. Uh, as we get better tools, and I always encourage people to produce better tools and ones that I can use, then uh, we can go more to that model where the things that you build are automatically created rather than having to go through the process of doing a lot of manual layout and things like that. So I'm talking about uh, about uh, analog uh, generators, so like this uh, Berkeley analog generator, so which uh, can create uh, quite sophisticated analog IPs. But it is open source. The, uh, so, so the one for Berkeley, the AG. Okay, I think again. Yeah. Uh, and the second question is, um, uh, so, uh, so the ultimate goal is always to go to, a, to, a tape, to the tape out, so I understand it correctly. So the question is, so, so I, why are you not supporting uh, uh, so open PDK, for example? Uh, so just for, just for, uh, for, uh, for training purposes. 
Oh, we, we can support open PDKs for training purposes. I like to stress that people can do designs targeted to a specific foundry. You know, if anybody wants to use open PDKs, all these tools, all these open source tools, they're available for them to use on their own computers. What's good about the eFabless model is that they can go and use something that is targeted to a specific process. But sure, we can support, and to some extent, we do support open PDKs. Okay, thank you. There was last one time. last question there. If we have time. Hi. <laughs> um, so this is, this is a really interesting project to look at um, from my perspective as someone who's sort of moved into academia and um, has done lots of front-end design and who knows that in the near future they're going to have to fall down the rabbit hole of doing the sort of layout stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's a very deep rabbit hole and I know that um, that level of expertise um, is hard to find in an academic um, environment a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So how much... Um, I guess hand-holding, how, sort of, how much training and tutorials um, can you try and provide with this kind of thing to help it make it a bit more accessible? Um, we have a knowledge base of tutorial level uh, documents that you can use. Uh, for the most part, at the moment, we are more relying on ourselves uh, with working on the help desk system. So when you go into our help desk system, you're not getting some random person, you're getting one of us. And yeah, we'll help you through it. Uh, that will not scale to a, a large number of users, but it suffices for now. And I assume that when we scale to a large number of users, we will at that time have more documents and it will have to be more uh, document-based, just point you to the right document. Here's your tutorial, use that. Thanks. Can we take the question offline? Sure. And let's take the speaker again.